So I'm doing a follow-up of the Panorama behind the scenes interview that was aired last night by Channel 4 because there was a few facts missing and I was there at the time and I thought, you know, I was thinking about all the students right now that are missing out on their history and this actually was a piece of history and whether or not I enjoyed it or whether or not it was exciting or whatever, I was there and I witnessed it. So I thought I'd just um, show you a few documents and give you my, what, what my experience was and I'm going to tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and we'll take it from there. So just before I get into my experience at the time, the documentary was saying that she basically or implying that she was vulnerable and she was bamboozled into that interview with Martin Bashir and this has come about because some freedom of information requests for behind the scenes documents of the interview going back 25 years which I thought was quite interesting but the um the documentary never covered what those documents contained but they were the basic uh, conclusion was that she was a little bit paranoid, she was mentally unstable, it always goes back to that, and that the Panorama interview led to her downfall, or her fall from grace, or whatever words you want to use. The interview happened November the 20th, 1995. I was working for a news agency called London News Service, and I worked in the features department, so I wrote articles behind the scenes for magazines that followed up on news stories. So the day of the Panorama interview, my boss asked me if I wanted to stay behind and w watch the interview and do the follow-up stories for the tabloids and magazines because, I mean, that's what I did, but it was unusual in that they asked me to stay behind late at night because they thought there was going to be a massive follow-up from the actual interview. They thought there was going to be a request for articles in the media. And they, this was something they did on a routine basis. I mean, we did articles for all of the newspapers, all the magazines, and my boss had been in the business by that time 20 years, and he was very good at his job. And he asked me, you know, I think I was the only one at the time available, but I did it. So I sat there, watched the interview, and we were waiting for the phone call, to, for the phone to ring, to see if we could, you know, to so to start providing stories. And a strange thing happened. I remember there was no phone calls. It was it was not only radio silence; it was like a spooky radio silence. And at the time, you know, I remember. I was I didn't like working on this story. I didn't enjoy it very much for whatever reason. And I sat there all through the interview think you know just like the photograph just like oh my goodness what's going to happen here. And then nothing happened. I was no no work to be done, no um features to be written, no feedback, no follow up. It was just quiet and I remember my boss was a bit confused by that and he said well okay there's nothing to do there's no work you can go home now and I remember feeling yay <laughs> but I was really happy and out the door I skipped because I, I just didn't like working on this story I just I don't know why emotionally it triggers you all of this stuff it's just it was just overloaded over flooded with it working in a news agency and seeing the story every day and getting a bit fed up with it but I, 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 that memory stood out very strong in my mind so I thought I'd start with that. The only part of the interview that I really remembered or connected with and thought was good was the part at the end where she said strong women can be threatening to people and so I just thought I'd show you that clip. They see me as a, a threat of some kind, and I'm here to do good. I'm not, a dis I'm not a destructive person. Why do they see you as a threat? I think every strong woman in history has had to walk down a similar path, and I think it's the strength that causes the confusion and the fear. Why is she strong? Where does she get it from? Where is she taking it? Where is she going to use it? Why do the public still support her? When I say public, you go in and do an engagement and there's a great many people there. 
And it's true, her pulling power to attract a crowd was unsurpassed. I know how fed up I was doing the stories about her going to the gym, coming to the, you know, whatever. But all of her charity work, everything she did, she did, she was a spotlight and she did get an awful lot of attention. But what happened to me about six weeks after this event, around Christmas time, well, actually it was to be more accurate, it was probably about three weeks after this, an event happened in my personal life that came into the media and it started, it was quite a dramatic shift and it started a very quick descent into me leaving journalism. And I didn't leave until, I didn't hand in my notice to the agency until the end of April the following year. But really, by Christmas time, which was obviously just a few weeks after this, I was done. And I'll maybe do another video on that because that is another news story. So after I left the news agency, I still did freelance feature writing for some publications and it was mainly about alternative health. And I slowly graduated over the next two, three years into a whole different career, which was basically a personal choice of mine. But I was still, you know, reading the newspapers and checking out stories and seeing what was happening, you know, keeping up with what was going on. At the time, you know, work was few and far between. Freelancing in London, it's, it's not an easy thing and you have to kind of juggle a few different eggs in a few different baskets to keep going and I so that's what I did and but just to catalogue those events I just want to do a quick roundup here's a clip from January 24th 1996 talking about the appointment of our new PR executive Jane Atkinson Prince of Wales the princess herself was at her gym again, and whether she feels isolated or not, she certainly has a rather depleted office, consisting now of two personal assistants. Four people have left her employ in the last two months. Yesterday, her chauffeur and one of her PAs became the latest to depart. A new press secretary will be announced shortly. It is expected to be Jane Atkinson. Jane is very self-assured. She thinks with great clarity. She's uh, very experienced. Uh, I've actually in the past presented Jane with awards for PR. She's been in consultancy where one has to think and act objectively. So I think on the face of it, she's a very, very good choice for the job. The princess's last press secretary, Geoffrey Crawford, resigned as a result of the Panorama interview. And given the continuing international interest in her, most public relations professionals believe that Jane Atkinson is not likely to have an easy task. Tom Bradby, ITN in central London. The divorce, obviously, in the media was high drama, and I remember watching it at the time. And, you know, journalists, the whole, everybody was glued to their seat because it was a fascinating subject. We'd all been put through this fantasy of happy ever after. So, you know, now we've got the divorce, now things are becoming a bit more real. And so you couldn't escape it, it was everywhere. Within one month of Jane Atkinson being her PR, <clears throat> a statement was put out, and I'll just read it to you. It was appeared in the Irish Times. In a gesture seemingly aimed at wrong-footing her enemies at Buckingham Palace, the princess made the news public without warning her husband, and she had claimed in a formal statement to have secured a settlement including a royal title and the right to live at Kensington, Kensington Palace, which has yet to be agreed. The palace was very quick to respond to this faux pas, actually, this PR faux pas, if you will. I mean, the, obviously it's reflecting bad on Diana, but it was the role of her public relations executive to manage the communication around the divorce. That's why she was paid. That's what her job was, and that's what she was there tasked to do. So the, uh, the palace announced that the Queen was most interested to hear that the Princess of Wales had agreed to the divorce. And then went on to say, 
Details of the divorce settlement and the princess's future role were not discussed. So, two conflicting statements on the same day at the same time. And as we know, Princess Diana lost her royal title in the divorce, her HRH title. Now, had she not had a PR person, we could have blamed her for that mistake. But because it was the PR person's job to manage the communication around the subject, that was a massive blooper, if you ask me. No, it could have been an intentional blooper. It could have been. It could have been. But to me, it looks like a setup job. It looks like a mistake on Jane's part. And in the next clip, which according to Marketing Week in an article dated the 2nd of August, 96, happened under Jane Atkinson's watch. And if ever there was a PR disaster, I mean, this was one of them. This was massive. I'd had a particularly difficult week and I was in my prayer time. I'd prayed for a little bit of light relief and I didn't think that God would send me the Princess of Wales. As often, Diana was drawn to the suffering of others. I told her that I'd lost all this money, that I had nowhere to live for three years, that um, I'd got mega personal problems uh, with a boyfriend who I'd been with for 22 years. And she was understanding and caring. One of Diana's friends later told George that the princess could not stop talking about him throughout their stay. Moved by his problems, she had made a pointed remark to George about her own. After we'd got to the hotel and we talked about this, we'd stayed in the car. And it was a very emotional thing. She reached over, she put a hand on my shoulder and she said, but at least you're free. Meanwhile, Spanish paparazzi were soon on the scene. Diana's legendary ability to spot photographers at 100 yards did not fail her, but perhaps her common sense did. Disaster struck for the princess when she was allegedly snapped topless. There was frenzy as George fulfilled the promise he had made to take the royal party back to the airport. The possible existence of topless photographs of the Princess of Wales had turned a weekend break into a media sensation. This article is saying that because Jane Atkinson tipped off the press as to Diana's whereabouts in Malaga, that she was telling the truth and that Diana wanted a dark spin doctor to practice the dark arts, that Diana was a bad person because Jane Atkinson told the press where she was. It also... Um, describes the princess as an albatross around Jane's neck and it's quite insulting and it calls her loopy and that's the same narrative they've pushed for a long time now that she's mentally unstable and it has to be seen to be believed. One of the things I've heard again and again is they kind of refer to her, uh, Diana as a little bit of a loose woman and I'm sure they were trying to be funny when they said in the article, and I quote, she must tell the Queen of Hearts to confine herself to modest, self-effacing charitable works and to desist from picking up gorgeous hunks at her Keep Fit Club. In short, 
To be the apple of the public eye, she should spend much less time in it. If keeping your client's phone number and whereabouts secret as a PR person is spin doctoring and dark and wrong, then the whole PR industry would collapse overnight. So I don't know where this columnist is coming from or going with this. Maybe he, he was just trying to write something funny. But because she was so hounded and mobbed on a regular basis, it in retrospect, it doesn't look very funny. In the next clip, she is where she asks the public for space and time and to have a private life and hear her disappointment that in order to have her privacy, she has to give up a job that she loves. As always, an electrical storm of photographer's flashbulbs as the Princess of Wales arrived for another charity function. But this was to be no routine engagement. The Princess, awaiting her turn to speak, seemed ill at ease. Most of her audience had no idea what was coming. In the past 12 years, I can honestly say that one of my greatest pleasures has been my association with people like yourself. During those years, I've met many thousands of wonderful and extraordinary people, both here and around the world. The cared for and the carers. To the wider public, may I say that I've made many special friends. I've been allowed to share your thoughts and dreams, your disappointments and your happiness. You have also given me an education by teaching me more about life and living than any books or teachers could have done. My debt of gratitude to you all is immense. I hope in some small way I have been of service in return. The media has always been riveted by this beautiful royal. The princess said today that when she started public life, she realized that newspapers would scrutinize her activities intensely. But I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become, nor the extent to which it would affect both my public duties and my personal life in a manner that's been hard to bear. So foreign tours in the new year have been cancelled and she'll cut drastically all public appearances. Her most recent official one was her unexpected appearance at Enniskillen in Northern Ireland on Remembrance Sunday. Her speech made deliberate reference to her sons and a clue as to what she hopes more privacy will enable her to concentrate on. My first priority will continue to be our children, William and Harry, who deserve as much love and care and attention as I am able to give, as well as a, an appreciation of the tradition into which they were born. Buckingham Palace insists the Queen was consulted about Diana's decision and her statement. The Princess paid tribute to the kindness and support of Her Majesty and the Duke of Edinburgh. The Palace denied any talk that the Princess had been pushed out by those keen to bolster the Prince of Wales's public image, though he was not mentioned today. I hope you can find it in your hearts to understand and to give me the time and space that has been lacking in recent years. She acknowledged the support, kindness, affection, love and care of the public journey. at large. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Not for generations has a member of the royal family made such a dramatic personal declaration. Those who heard it sympathized. I thought she looked nervous. She looked strained, and I thought she needed a break. Well, I think I think it took a tremendous amount of courage to stand up there in front of all these people and, and speak like she did. So I admire her definitely. Uh, I 
I thought it was a very sad statement that she has been driven out of public life as a result of these intrusions into her private life. And I just hope the government will have the courage at this stage to act at last so that people in her position can have some privacy. There are bound to be suspicions that her husband's recent plea for his role, especially backing British business, be taken more seriously, has played its part. Interest in her may only be heightened if less of her life is lived under the public's gaze. Nicholas Owen, News of 10, with the Princess of Wales in central London.